Another ZDTV day, and uh, you, you know, those of you who watch us live might be thinking to yourself, uh, where have Clint and Ken been? It is 11.30 Eastern, currently daylight time, not standard. Uh, although I'd like to be able to blame this on daylight savings time, or just daylight saving time. Uh, I can't. So I uh, had a meeting that ran a little bit long and wasn't able to pull ZDTV together. Didn't know if we were to have a ZDTV today. So Ken and I were talking and Ken's like, hey, I got uh, something interesting going on. Why don't we like look at this interesting thing? And so this interesting thing, it, oh, I'm not even sharing my screen. See, I'm all out of sorts today. We wanted to do the entire screen and share this right here. Boom. All right, here's the slide I whipped up in approximately 35 seconds talking about Xerox for servers. What does that even mean? I don't even know if it's accurate, but I thought it was as good as I could come up with in uh, the 30 seconds it took me to make the slide. So Ken, are you ready to be brought on stage? Give me the quick nod. Yeah. All right. Ken gave me the thumbs up and here he is, everybody. Ken. Hey. Hey, Ken. How's it going, buddy? Well, I'm... I've, I've been uh, I'm like just at the point of having this ready enough to share. So I'm excited that you were a go to uh, give it a little airtime. I'm sure it's going to be in a rough state, but hopefully <laughs> this uh, this gets the wheels turning. I mean, I I don't know about you, but I, I take a, <laughs> I take a I take a tiny bit of perverse pleasure in, <laughs> <laughs> in watching people flounder. I uh -huh. do a fair bit of it myself, and I I have no compunction that I am not the best and perfect person in the world, and I acknowledge my mistakes and I accept them. So I'm sure I acknowledge your mistakes as well, Clint. <laughs> That's good. There are many, Ken. There are many. That's good. All right. So uh, what are, does does Z Rock for servers make sense? Is that a was that a quick title? Does that did, what do you think? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, yes, basically. Um, I'll bring on my screen here and, and, and that was interesting. Oh, that was interesting. oh I need to fix that. You, you don't share the audio. <laughs> there we go. It should be fixed now. Hey, all right. Why isn't it? Uh, why am I maximized? We don't want that. You're so tiny. There we go. All right. So this is my little, uh, this is my use statement for the Xerox share service. Okay. Do you want to take us through it or do you want me to read it? Well, see if it uh, resonates with you or if it raises more questions than it answers. All right. Is so this you? Is what me? Do we have a is chat? This, is, does this describe you? Does it, does, does, it does not describe me. That is for sure. So let's take a look at and see what we have here. Xerox share is a system D service that persists a Xerox share. Uh, you have an always on connected box hmm, and want to privately host a public authenticated hardened HTTP site or service. Basically your, your actual web server can be anywhere, but you have a, an internet facing hardened uh, reverse proxy that is Xerox. And so by connected box, you mean uh, internet you connect. have a server somewhere which has outbound internet connectivity. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. No incoming firewall rules necessary mm -hmm. for that. All right. So add the OpenZD package repo and install Xerox share. This can be curl bash or a gnarly one liner. Set up or sign up for Xerox and copy your environment token. That's kind of a prerequisite. Edit the yeah. share config file with your env token and backend URL. Start the Xerox share service. Visit the Xerox console, observe the environment, share in the graph. All right. So, um, questions I have immediately. Yeah. are 
uh, it says edit the Xerox share config file with your env token and backend URL. Yeah, um, so I'm just going to burn my uh, staging account here by sharing it. But when you go to the Xerox console, you see a graph of your environments. And each environment might have zero or more shares dangling off of it like this. And so your account is your, your Xerox signup. That's your login. And each, de each device might have uh, multiple environments. So for each time that you use your each, each device can have multiple environments. Sure. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's just a but most devices will have one. Because if you just run Xerox, then it uses your home directory. So the Xerox share service has its own home directory assigned by and managed by system D. So, so another option, instead of exposing my environment, in that environment, or was it the, uh, the share, um, what's the, what's the magic, what was the word again? The, uh, the token, the, uh, the enable token, that's the word enable. Yeah. That is a secret. Right and yep. needs to be treated as such. Don't don't no don't don't show it. Don't show. Well, it. I think I'm going to end up showing it anyway, just because <laughs> just out of mistake. <laughs> well, my point. <laughs> we'll have to show the file, and I want to show it actually. Ah, but see where I was heading mm -hmm. is instead of putting it into the file, would not another option be to simply ensure that the user who's going to run Xerox has previously been Xerox enabled. Would that not be sufficient? Well, it um, it it crosses the streams, so it is possible to implement a Xerox service that uses a particular user's home directory. But a mm -hmm. system service is managed by root and sandboxed in a way by system D, so it doesn't necessarily have access to a particular user's home directory. So that's where the Xerox environment secrets live, because you take your account enable token. That's your environment enable token. It's the it's a token you use to enable environments. So basically you can print environments by using this token, right? Uh, so for each home directory where you are on a device, then you would say Xerox enable, use that token and you get an environment that shows up in this graph. Mm -hmm. That has, as you know, under the hood, a ZD identity. Mm -hmm. And anything you do with Xerox in that environment using that identity gets pinned to that environment. It isn't shared with other environments that might get enabled with the same token. So I feel like you explained Xerox very well, thank you. But it's still uh, what I'm, uh, and for everybody's information, I am a, I'll say, we, we, actually, let me ask Ken. Ken, on the Linux scale of noob to Ken, where would you put Clint? Is he way down at the basics? Is he somewhere in the middle? Is he up to top? I know he's You not. do all right. All right, so I'm in the middle. All right, so I'm not a noob, but I'm also not Ken. But uh, the reason why I bring that up is because I'm still confused. I, in my naivete, I know what a systemd service is. I know I can choose to run it as a particular user, should I uh -huh. want to. And I know that it will run as root if I don't, right? You said something that I don't know about um, systemd sandboxing things. And what I still wonder... I still think I, I, that that systemd service would run as root, wouldn't it? And it would have access to root's home directory, wouldn't it? So if I enabled root with in Xerox, wouldn't that systemd service just work? Because well, it'll it be would, using it, root's home directory, right? It would, uh, if it was running as root, uh, systemd does not, it, uh, you don't, you're not necessarily running as root. Um, like a, a yeah, this is what I, this is where I don't know. Yeah, a poorly crafted service or a service that has a very specific reason why it must run as root, which is extremely rare and usually points toward it being poorly crafted, uh, might run as root. But it's no, no. I mean, it, like if you need a problem if it runs as root, yeah. I mean, if you need a port under ten twenty four, you basically run it as root. That's what the world basically would do, right? Some people would go more uh, targeted give the correct permissions to the correct things. Right. But right. I think the world will run it as root. 
the right thing to do would be to enable ambient capabilities or or to make you you're weighing your options between enabling ambient capabilities and granting a specific network privilege to that service that's inherited by the one process that it runs or you on that entire system you change the lowest port that non-root users can bind from 1024 to 80 or whatever right and my assertion is that most people just run it as root well, to, to leap ahead, <laughs> leap, leap ahead to your implication, there's no reason for Xerox to run as root. It doesn't need any special yeah. privileges. It just needs access to its own files. Exactly. So that's what I was like. If I made a new user for this service, couldn't I enable that user? And that way I, I wouldn't, I mean, so I'm, 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 what I'm pressing on here is why mm -hmm. put that special important token into that special important file? Why not just enable the environment through one a one-time enablement and then not have that that special token in that special file so you're you're basically saying why not introduce a new manual step a new manual prerequisite step instead of placing it in the file it could be part of the install stage could it not uh like, is your is your goal to eliminate the exposure of the yeah that, i mean that's the that's the, the hypothetical file? yeah that's the hypothetical Okay. You know, solu not solution, but that's what you are mitigating. Yeah. Well, that might be nice. I can see a way to do that. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, like if you really don't want to save it in the file at all, then you could run a prerequisite step to enable the environment for the service. Yeah. Then right. we could just bundle a new script or add a new function on the script so that exactly it does that for you, and then then you run the service, and it uh, never needs to have that secret in its yeah. in its config file totally doable and that's a yeah. that's a good idea i think to at least <gasps> have that ability nice i yeah. feel like i feel very vindicated or verified now thank you yeah your i think your intuitions are sound there <laughs> all right anyway we can go back to to what you were showing so this is what the uh, environment file it is illegible like. Okay. Well, I'll make it better then. Can you embiggen it pretty please? Yeah, I'm I'm going to do color coding too. This is the colors that you run with most days? Uh this is what I've been running with recently. It's called the <laughs> Monokai color scheme. I find it's that a... I find that entertaining. I do not like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it's all right. That's all right. Well, I don't have, have to look at it then. I don't have to like it. <laughs> uh, it's pretty easy to, I think it's pretty easy to change. I've been just pasting the color codes into the two. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know what it is. Can, uh, we're taking a tangent, but it, I mean, yeah. I love a beautiful terminal. Like, so I. And this is I not feel, it. <laughs> well, just that red and that the, the contrast on the red and the, the gray is a little yeah. bit too much. Like I like, you know, the orange or gold or whatever you call it. Oh, right. it's the Solarized 256 yeah. uh, theme that I'm playing with right now. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, sorry for making your eyes bleed. No, it's not so bad. I'm just... Um, so this environment name, these are the things you can set and must set after you do a Xerox, I mean, uh, install Xerox share, which was this stuff right here. Add the package repo, sign up for Xerox. Um, but, uh, if you set this environment name, then that's what will appear in the Xerox console, like Docker reserve share. This is like the default format username at host. And, um, that was a container test that I did. The enable token is a secret we were talking about. We could move that out of this file or make it optional in this file, but right now it's a must. It's the only place the script can get it from. And then, and and, yeah. and for what it's worth, the resultant identity is also a secret, right? When when yeah. you enable your environment, you'll have a strong identity in the form of a a, a file on your file system that is a key and. Uh, certificate. So that is also a, a secret. The difference to me is that particular secret mints other identities like you were talking about. And right. I, I'm much more attuned to scary passwords like that than identities. Anyway, 
And anyway. here's where the the systemd sandbox is going to maintain that. This is where it ends up. And systemd maintains the user permissions and, and stuff on that for the service. So the service doesn't actually run as a predictable user. Systemd provisions a dynamic user for that and maintains the permissions in the sandbox. So this is basically a state directory, varlib Xerox share. And that's the home uh, for the, the user that runs the service. But we were looking at the environment file. There's only that one more thing that you need to define, and that's the back end. So there are three different types of back ends that you can choose from. And those are a URL to a web server that you can reach from this host, a directory of static HTML. So Xerox itself will run a caddy server and serve that, or a custom caddy file. You can provide a caddy file configured any way you want. So, you just so, define so you're end. saying that um, using Xerox, I can share any HTTP content I want? Yep. Any, you can just give it a static HTML directory right here. And when you start the service, it will serve that up. That is super cool. And we can do that one if you want. That's actually a little bit easier to, to, to demo. Share the doc directory on my computer. Does it have a bunch of HTML in it? It has files in it. <clears throat> oh, no, I wanted to see an actual service, like, um, I don't know, some website or whatever. But uh, if you don't have an HTML page, then... That's fine. Find one. <laughs> Maybe this guy. Oh, there's some doc in there. Yeah, look, you got user share doc. User share doc H indexed HTML, but you got all kinds. Yeah, there's one right there. We could share this Zor. No, no, just share your doc folder, and then we can find it. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, that'll yeah. work. If you do, if you do put an index HTML at the top level of the directory that you share, it'll just present that web page. So our our friends and compatriots, the 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 people working on Cloud ZD, could use Xerox to share their Angular app. I don't know if Ryan's out there listening. I saw that he pinged me moments ago, and I can't answer him. But it's an Angular app that is delivered by some web server somehow, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's an SPA. I think it's an SPA. Uh, so you could use Xerox to host that. That's cool. That's super cool. I want to. I want to. I want to try that right right now. Right, because with an SPA, I'll go get Ryan. I'll go get Ryan and we'll share it's it. No. Static <laughs> HTML, right? You're, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. It's just files that you need to to deliver into the browser, and then they then the app runs in the browser with JavaScript, right? Yeah, yeah. So it would work. Um, and that does use Caddy in a simplistic configuration. Uh, you don't even need to know that you're using Caddy. But it's there. You'll see the caddy file browser if you don't have an index.html in that directory at the top level. So now the good stuff, this optional stuff, but this is kind of where we're going with this whole server use case is that you want your server to be fronted by Xerox. Xerox is going to take on the heavy burden of uh, web application firewall and rate limiting, uh, auth authentication, whatever kind of internet-facing, hardening goodness NetFoundry has put together for Xerox, you get to benefit from all of that just by fronting it with Xerox. And then you can go ahead and configure these uh, OAuth provider and optionally restrict it to specific email strings or domains. Like you can say, I want to allow any Gmail user or any at acme.corp, or you can say a list of specific emails that you want to allow. And... Uh, it couldn't be easier to set up OIDC this way because you just say Google and Hang on one, one quick second. So yeah. what you showed me there is that is every user who is allowed to access the service. Is that what that is? Right. And so to configure this, you could do C D O V H spam is a good one at gmail.com. <laughs> D C D O V H. No, no. D O V H as in my last name. C D O V H. There you go. At Gmail. That's one that anybody can mail me at if they're interested. <laughs> now I've got a list of emails that are going to be allowed to access our service. And uh, you can. Uh, 
if you know what you're doing with Xerox, you can always add more command line options. That out of out of curiosity, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Out of curiosity, this is probably a more bashism than anything else. Can I embed line feeds in there too and put them on new lines and make it easy that way? You're saying, could you do like this? Oh, oh, do you have to do it that way? No, no, I, I, I wanted, I wanted one gigantic string that had line feeds, you know, smooshed into it, like a Her Herodoc style, you know. Um, it is being sourced by the startup script, so in Bash. So yes, you can. Ooh, use better that. yet, can we make it a text file that can just be maintained? Yes, we could. All right. Uh, uh, these are just ideas. I, again, these are warts and all, like you were saying. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm just tossing ideas out here as sure. as they come at me. So that's none cool. of this is none of this is necessary. I'm just wondering. Oh, that's the gold right there. That's kind of what I want. Is uh, like, what? How does how does it feel? How do you want it to work? So yeah, we've we've basically created an access list here of uh, based on the email address. So this is going to be the email property in the JWT that comes from the OIDC provider. Yeah. Right. So when you when like you're going to get a cookie. How many how many OID, GitHub and Google are enabled? That's. What, I was going to. I was well. Sorry. I was. I was reading. I don't see line numbers. So I was. I was wondering what the different OAuth providers were, and I'm sure that um, it's all documented. But I was just reading in there <clears throat> to see which ones were allowed. And oh yeah. Google. So Xerox IO has already set up Google and GitHub. So all you have to do is say the name, yeah. and it works. But if you are self-hosting Xerox, uh, you could set up any OIDC provider. Well, and of course, oh, you uh, can, yeah, and and Xerox and IO could add new ones at any time, and then you would just need to say their name and provide the email addresses. All right, uh, so I think all we this in in our environment looks like it's all, all already uh, share, set up or already enabled. So let me just. I don't actually see it here, so I'll have to. I, I've already deleted the environment from my console, so I will need to. Uh, I'll go off screen for a second and add the enable token into my file, and then I'll come right back. It's an enabled environment. see the environment appear on this graph uh, when the service is restarting. There we go. So now we have a new environment and now we have a service user share doc does that show up on your screen yeah i'm watching the little right. ui bounce around yep so i'll click on the share and click on the this public url now this is a reserved public url in this instance of xerox so did did you so like i only saw the xerox api and you were off screen doing a thing so i'm wondering what you did out there did did you use the xerox share thing i'll show package? you what Here's the steps I took. I destroyed the environment and I destroyed the reservation that had existed from the prior test run. And then I restarted the service. Let me make that bigger. This was a false start because I forgot to delete the reservation. And so the service, uh, Xerox share service, 
it doesn't know how to delete the reservation or expects the reservation to be there or why, why would it well, fail? It creates this file and it doesn't remove it because the front end is coupled to the back end configuration. So if you needed to change like the OAuth provider or you basically wanted to change the from like web to proxy or caddy, then that's a new back end configuration and you would need a new reservation. Okay. So to, to, to say, yes, I really want to do that, you would delete the reservation file and you could use the same environment and it would and just restart the service and it would uh, make the current configuration effective as a new reservation. Okay. That is actually working. We did a restart and this is the contents of user share doc on my computer. It shows up as user share doc share right here. And this, I can share this URL and then change out the, the back end at will without. So, so anybody who goes there right now would need yeah. to be able to be authorized. So I, I could not, yeah. I could, I could get there if I log in. You could get there, but if I go here in incognito, then we see the login screen for Google. Yeah. So that's really cool. And if I authenticate as somebody else, then it won't let me in. Right. But um, here I'll send this URL to you and you should be able be able to authenticate. Get that in Mattermost? I did. I actually have it open. Look at that. Very cool. So here I am. Well, I mean, I can show my screen. Boop, boop, do 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 Actually, well, you know what I'll do? I'll go into private mode as well. Boom. So there's my screen. Click on the the Xorg. There's actually a, a nice little search feature built into the index page. What's your password, Clint? It's a real good question, Ken. I don't know. Don't I have, a, I have a password manager, <laughs> but I do have two-factor authentication, as any good person does. I can tell yes, all the good me. people. <laughs> Only the good people. That's right. And that that makes it's, you good. It's the, that, that's right. That is exactly right. <laughs> that's all I have to do. Uh, I can. What did you say? Phone. What did you say uh, has good search? Xorg. Oh, if you if you filter for Xorg and then click on it, that one had an index HTML, so it'll just show up as a website. Very cool. Yep. So there you go. You saw me have to log in and everything. Nice. Yep. Back to you, Ken. All right. So we have this is this is what the package manager says about it. It's right now in a testing repo, soon to be available in the main ZD repo. And it has the instructions right here. So if you don't remember anything else, you can just say show or info, depending on your package manager on the package name. Uh, installing this package gets you everything that you need to, to run it. And um, yeah, that's it. Here's the instructions. Is that, and and uh, you must have had to add some repo somewhere? You have to subscribe the repo, yeah. Yeah, and where is that documented? Well, right now it's, it's, it's so it's going to be the same as it is for ZD. If we go to the... So go, if I just subscribe to the Tunnelers repo, I can apt install Xerox here? wrong link if I go to downloads go to my operating system Linux then these are the steps right here to subscribe to the ZD repo under downloads and <clears throat> um, that simply gets your environment subscribed to a new package manager right that it, that subscribes your package manager to a source of packages. Gotcha. So and we're so, a vendor. We're a package. So here vendor, we here we, we go. Repo. Let's see how we're, we're going to do it live, Ken. Let's see how All it right. goes. So I have. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at it. I see Kubernetes, Docker, Android, iOS, Linux. I click on Linux, and I'm in Windows subsystem for Linux, which is a Deb family. It says 
install the ZDH tunnel deb it gives me a link. I'm going to click on it. What does that do? That brings me to the deb. It says packages are available, blah, blah, blah. Well, you went oh. to the tunneler. I just clicked the, the link that it was right there. Well, oh, the ZD command. Coming. Yeah. I see. See? That's, uh, I lost some cred. I just clicked on a thing. Um, I see. So the, the ZD CLI and the tunneler, are they all the same thing? Do they all do the repos? Because the tunneler is built for very specific distros. Different. Well, it's gotcha. built it's built for a handful of distros. It's built for a lot more than just but the ZD and Xerox have something in common. They're both go binaries. So gotcha. they're so I can just copy this and just them. run it? That will install ZD. If you skip the last two steps, then you would have only subscribed to the repo. All right. So uh, you can go ahead and install the ZD CLI too, but you don't need it for Xerox. Right. There it goes. Oh, apparently I've already done it once. Who knew? Yeah, it doesn't hurt to update the, the trusted pub key for that particular package source. Call the Xerox service. Well, so Xerox isn't there in in that repo yet. It's in the other testing repo, um, oh. which so I, people can just do this. Well, they can if they want to go ahead and and try the testing repo. But what you are looking at is the main repo, which is like the for release versions. Right. If you does, want to, um, hmm? does our doc comment on the testing repo? So there, there is a pre-release repo there in the dock. If you go, if you scroll down to where it says pre-release repo for Debian family, uh -huh. uh, where Xerox is, is actually a uh, stage before that. So it hasn't found its way <laughs> into the, the documented repos yet. Okay. So anybody watching this in the future, they'll be able to see it. Yeah. But as soon as yeah, then. that's where we're at. Um, you can go, there's no problem if you want to go ahead and install from the other, it's not like a secret. It's just not advertised because it, there's no assumption of stability. Yeah, of course. I'm not going to um, do that, but I'll go ahead and, and post the repo to, to you. So you can subscribe to that one. And no, I'm not interested if you want to. Nope. Not interested. Nope. I, don't, right. I, need, I need my thing to work. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it's just going to create a file. See, in those instructions where it creates a list file, that's what it would be. It would be a new list file for the pre-pre-testing repo, and that's where you would get the Xerox package today. But maybe tomorrow you can get it from the regular pre-release repo. Cool. And that's that's it, right? Like that's we it. are at the end, and and at that point, you now have all the goodness built into Xerox. You have yourself a. Oh, I wanted to ask. Um, you had talked about the reserved share. So it's making a reserved share on your yes. behalf. How does the user, when you start that share, can you go back and show me when they, when you start that share, what does the user see? How do I know what my share is? Oh yeah, sure thing. Put your yeah. thing on the screen here. Pull that back up. So in the Xerox console, you've got your account and you've got your... Oh, I would go to, I, do I have to go to the console? Because like, I don't know if you've made a busy Xerox environment yet, but when you make a busy one, it's hard to find what you're looking for. So hopefully the CLI will tell me because that's really what I want to see. It does appear in the log for the system service here. All right. Cool. That's what I need. Right at the top. All right, then. Easy enough. Uh, when I... When I and, and, yeah, interesting. It would be nice to somehow uh, get that even more easily. I don't know how, but if you can think of some other way to help help a person know what their URL is. Because we don't have vanity URLs yet, right? When we have vanity URLs, we could maybe add a vanity to that. And so that... Let's see um, if it shows up in what the oh, actually, status command. It you had a file that you left behind. What was that file? Where is that? Uh... Remember when you before you had deleted a file? Yeah. What was that file? What was that is? And that's from Xerox. Yeah. So this is a file that's created by Xerox that contains the front end endpoints as well. Oh, that's that's what I re that's way easier. That's perfect. That's much better than a journal CTL grep command. Okay. Well, yeah. on that advice, I'll just guide people to spit the contents of that file out if they. Maybe I would pick. I would pick out the the front ends. You know, yeah, 
Because there's only one, right? Yep. And then uh, position zero and minus R. I got you. Yeah. Perfect. Love it. All right. Well, cool. I think that's a great ZDTV, Ken. Uh, yeah. Thanks for taking us on a tour. Not too many Welcome. warts. Uh, some ideas here and there. That was fun. Thanks, bud. Yeah.